Hello and welcome to this lecture on Genomic SAM. In this lecture we're discussing what goes into Genomic SAM before you can actually fit a structural equation model. So it's basically a class on how the sausage made, right? So some of these things are details that are good as background, uh, good for you to understand once you use Genomic SAM, but basically stuff that's largely handled by internal functions of genomic SAM, so it means you don't have to do anything like this by hand. And to discuss what goes into genomic SAM, it's good to discuss two other things, namely what kind of information goes into a structural equation model in general, right? You can use raw data, but you could also use the covariance matrix of the raw data to fit the structural equation model or a regression model, as we'll see in the example. And it's good to discuss what LD score regression is exactly. It's a very commonly used technique to estimate genetic covariance uh, and or heritability. And it actually is one of the main ways genomic SEM can estimate from raw GWAS data, so raw summary statistics, the genetic covariance between traits and the heritabilities, which you can then use to fit a structural equation model too. Okay, so first, we'll discuss what kind of information goes into a structural equation model and show you that basically you can either use raw data to get a structural equation model to work, but you can also use the covariance matrix of that raw data. And that's an important conceptual step, right? Because if you understand that, you can later understand why we can fit structural equation models while we don't observe any raw data in genomic SEM. And with raw data, I mean phenotypic observations. We don't observe those at all in genomic SEM. The only thing that goes in is the GWAS summary data. So now we'll switch over to R and I'll go through a little example in which I create a data set and then fit a structural equation model. And then I'll take only the covariance matrix of the data set and fit the same structural equation model to illustrate what goes on in such an example. I didn't really clear my workspace before. So let's do that. So we have a fresh start. The first thing we'll do in this R script is we will require some packages I need to generate some data and to fit structural equation models. So the MUS package allows me to generate data from distributions and Lavan will allow me to fit structural equation models. Okay, then we'll run these. We'll also run this line, which states that the variable n is 10,000. We'll use the variable n for sample size all throughout the example. Then we'll generate three random variables, x1, x2, and x3. And we'll also generate random variable y, which is a function of x1, x2, x3, and some residual variance that's not attributable to all those variables. So what does variable y look like? Something like this. What does x1 look like? Well, x1 was normal, right? As we just generated from a random normal variable, this is what it looks like. Okay. We'll combine all those variables into a data set, right? The data set just keeps together all the variables in one place. Now the variables also have a relationship because that's the way we define them, right? So we could make a plot of y against x1, and we'd see there'd be some sort of relationship where if x1 is higher, then y is also higher, which is exactly what we expect given that we just made y a function of x1, right? Okay. Now on these data, we can fit a linear regression model, which I do right here, in which we regress y on x1, on x2, and on x3. And we know what will come out of the linear regression model. Why? Because we just defined the relationship between y and x, right? We defined the relationship as y being equal to 0.4 times x1, 0.5 times x2, and minus 0.2 times x3. So if you run the model, oh, I forgot to run the data set line. This is instructive. You know, when you, when you, when you're programming, you always make mistakes. I'm not going to cut it out of the video because I think it's instructive to notice that we also just, you know, mess this up all the time. Maybe it's not that instructive, but I mess this up all the time. Okay. 
so now I've run the lines we need to, to run a linear model. As you can see, this is the way you define a model in R. Andrew has a video up on, on how you can define models in Lavan, but in R, the, the regression model uses a tilde as an equation sign and plus to add additive terms. And so this linear model using the function LM, it's fit, linear regression, and we can get a summary using the, the summary function applied to the object in which the linear model is stored. Now, as you may expect, the coefficients we get from the model are very close to the values we use to generate the data. They're not exact because generating random data also introduces slight bits of noise. So x1 gets an estimate of 0.40, which is its true value thereabouts. X2 gets 0.49, while the true value is 0.5, and then X3 gets minus 0.16, while the true value is minus 0.2. So they're all close to their true value, which is great. The linear model uh, works, which is, I guess, not entirely unexpected. You can fit the linear model, the same model. Oops, spelling error. You'll get this code, by the way. I'll make sure it's available. You can fit the same model in Lavan using this as a, as a descriptor of the model. Now, Andrew went through the syntax for Lavan, so you should be able to understand this, but I'm gonna read it out anyway. It basically defines one regression. Y is regressed on X1, X2, and X3. And it then explicitly defines the covariance between X1, X2, X1, X3. And actually, I just noticed, it should also include the covariance between x2 and x3. Okay, and then using sem, which is the Lafam function, and adding the data set we created, the raw data, the observed data to the data argument, we can fit the sem model. And let's have a look. Now a structural equation model is capable of estimating the same parameters as a regression model. So here you go. Y regressed on X1, 0.4, Y regressed on X2, 0.49, and Y regressed on X3, minus 0.16. So this is just a very convoluted indirect way to fit the same model. Now notice, because this is a, this is a structural equation model, we could fit many, many more models with these four variables. We'd be flexible. We could, we could say, well, actually, y is an outcome of x1, 2, and 3, but we suspect x2 to be an outcome of x3, right? And we could fit a mediation model in which y is regressed on all three variables and x2 is regressed on x3. We could define that model and we could see what the parameter fit is. That's the flexibility you have in Lavan or a structural equation model or later in genomic SEM, but which you don't have in a linear regression model. That's not the point of this tutorial though. So let's get back to the point. I can create the covariance between uh, the variables in the data set using the cof function in R, right? And I'll get this object sigma, which has the covariance in it. Now, if we look at sigma, we'll see a matrix with covariances between y and x1 and x2 and x3, okay? And we can actually feed that covariance matrix to Lavan. So we use the same SEM function, the same model. Now, instead of giving it raw data, we're giving it the covariance matrix and we're giving it the number of observations because it needs to know how precisely all the elements in the covariance matrix are fit. And we can run these and we'll get exactly the same or very similar outputs, right? So this is, I am running this on SEM model two, right? So this is the model that doesn't know about the raw data. It just knows about the covariance and you get the same regression parameters. Now, this works because in a SEM model, you define the covariance, the cells of the covariance matrix in terms of the regression parameters. And then you ask the model to seek out the regression parameters that minimize the distance between the observed covariance matrix in the data and the covariance matrix implied by the model. And so we don't need the raw data we could do with the covariance. 
Now it's nice to have the raw data because sometimes you have missing data points or other sort of things going on where there's extra information hidden in the raw data that's not hidden in the covariance matrix. So it, in many cases, it's, it's far more valuable to have the raw data. But if you don't, you can fit these kind of models on the covariance matrix. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So we've covered that you can fit a structural equation model based on the covariances only, and that's a valid input for a structural equation model. Now, the input for genomic SEM are genetic covariances, which we get from GWAS summary data, right? So only from a factor of each SNP, a RAS number, the effect allele, so which of the two alleles is actually increasing or decreasing the traits, the Z statistic associated with that allele, so it's the test statistic of the, the linear regression association in the GWAS, and that's all, all we're putting in to getting the covariances. Now, we'll get those genetic covariances and heritabilities using LD score regression. Now, what is LD score regression? LD score regression actually tries to explain the signal that is created in a GWAS. So this is a Manhattan plot of a GWAS of schizophrenia, and these hits highlighted in green, they only explain 4% of variability. But the heritability, according to twin studies, is 80%. So how do we go about explaining the rest? So if we visualize the same GWAS as a QQ plot, we'd see that the observed p-values are much smaller, so the, therefore the minus log p-values are bigger than what is expected under the expected distribution of a z-statistic. And so the question we, we ask is, is this, this inflation, right? Is this true signal or is it type one error that we'd like mess something up? Are we getting all these false positives? And that's the question we're asking ourselves when we're using LD score regression. And so this other really important ingredient for LD score regression is the, the LD structure of the genome. So what I've tried to depict here is a part of the genome and then each dark blue square is a SNP and the lighter blue squares depict the correlations between the adjacent SNPs. And LD introduces correlations between adjacent SNPs, which I'm sure has been covered in the days uh, before this presentation. This also is what creates these towers in, in the Manhattan plot, right? Because if one of these SNPs is associated truly with the trait, then, then due to LD, the other ones become correlated with the trait. So you can summarize these LD patterns into a score, which is basically for every SNP, just the sum of its LD with all its neighbors. That's basically the, the, the reflect how well the SNP is correlated to all the SNPs around it. And then consider there is a true genetic effect. Right, so on the left you can see I called this beta, so it's a true effect. So none of these SNPs has an effect except for this one. It has a tiny effect. If this were the true effect and we were to do a GWAS, we would get estimated betas. And so we'd get something like this, where we, we'd estimate the beta for the SNP with the true effect to be non-zero, but also for all the SNPs that are in LD with the SNP with the true effect, we'd expect a estimate of beta that is sort of yeah, raised. Now, what happens on the genome-wide scale is that those test statistics you could derive from, from the linear regression of a trait on every SNP, they go up for SNPs that have more LD. And they go up precisely because so many SNPs in the genome ha are associated with the traits, right? That if you tag more SNPs as a SNP, you are more likely to tag more true causal SNPs and therefore your, test, your signal goes up and your test statistic goes up. And it goes up in a, in a very specific fashion. It goes up proportional to the heritability, to the number of SNPs with a true effect, M, and with the sample size, right? Because power goes up when the N goes up. And so if the sample size goes up, the relationship between test statistics and LD scores goes up as well. So, and by the way, down there are Hilary Vanuken, Brandon Bullock Sullivan, Ben Neal, and Alex Price, who basically wrote the first few papers on this relationship. So, 
Going back to the little squares I've made, the chi-square statistics that you get from your GWAS, they are regressed on LD scores, which reflect how well each SNP tags its neighbors. And SNPs that tag more neighbors are expected to have higher test statistics. And then the slope of that regression is reflective of the heritability because the other unknowns in that equation, sample size and M, are known to us, right? Because we know how big the GWAS was. And then there's an intercept, which actually reflects things that do not correlate with LD score, such as population stratification, which is a very neat feature. So now we can separate the true signal from the signal introduced by population stratification. So how did they go about validating this? They actually did a GWAS of Swedish controls versus UK controls. So neither of these sets of people had a disease, but they differed mainly in their ancestry. And as you can see on the right hand side, the QQ plot of the GWAS, it does look inflated. It does look like there is signal there that is inconsistent with the distribution of test statistics under the null. However, if they plot the LD score of all the SNPs in bins against the test statistic in these bins, then there is no relationship. In other words, the test statistic doesn't go up with the LD, which means the signal is probably not a function of heritability, but a function of something else. In this case, population stratification. Now, if you do it with the real GWAS, like the schizophrenia GWAS we've discussed, you see that there is a steep and consistent correlation between the LD score bin SNP is in and the mean chi-square. The SNPs in each of these bins have, so the relationship is strong. And it's actually consistent with a SNP heritability for schizophrenia of like 40% and 90% of the signal is true. Okay, so that's how we get an estimate of heritability from GWAS summary statistics. So this slope estimates the heritability and if we have two traits, we get two slopes, but we can also, instead of using the chi-square test statistic, use the product of the Z statistics of the two traits, regress that on the LD score to get an estimate of genetic covariance between traits. So this is an example where the RG is 0.5. We get a slope consistent with that RG, genetic correlation. And this is an example where the RG is zero. We get a slope consistent with there being zero correlation. Okay. And it's robust, this, this entire technique, to sample overlap between the GWASs. Now, why is that? Because this intercept, in the case of genetic covariance, will actually absorb the sample overlap. So that's great. We can use GWASs from the same sample to estimate genetic correlation between traits, or we can use entirely a different sample. So we can correlate some MRI study to some metabolite study. Right? And that's insightful because it's really expensive to measure MRI and metabolites in the same people, or in, not always feasible. Okay, phase three of this lecture. What kind of information goes into a genomic structural equation model? Well, so these heritabilities and genetic covariances we have estimated are actually assembled into a uh, matrix S, which holds the genetic variance covariance matrix. So the top left, top left entry is the heritability of the first trait, and then all the, across the diagonal, we get the heritabilities of the other traits. And the off-diagonal entries are the covariances between the traits. Now, as we've seen at the very beginning of this uh, lecture, a covariance matrix is sufficient to estimate a structural equation model. However, if we use a covariance matrix to estimate a structural equation model in Lavan, we need the sample size. Now these estimates don't necessarily really have a sample size. Yes, the underlying GWAS has a sample size, but that doesn't translate directly into a precision or a standard error for these heritabilities. And so we need that information to be presented in a different way. So for every entry in this matrix S, we actually need to know its standard error or its variance. And we also need to know the covariance between the different estimates, right? So imagine I estimate the heritability of height and BMI in one sample, then those as the heritability estimates are interdependent, right? Because it's the same people in that sample that feed into those two estimates. And 
that dependency needs to be taken account of. That's what we do in constructing this matrix V, which basically has the squared standard errors or the variances of the heritabilities and the genetic covariances on, on the diagonal. So all the elements are, of S have a diagonal element in V that corresponds to their standard error or their squared standard error, their variance. And then the off diagonal elements in V are actually the dependencies between the elements of S. Now this matrix takes a while to compute, but it's basically computed in a very smart fashion that's called jackknifing, in which we basically estimate the LD score regression in chunks of the genome, 200 chunks of the genome, and then we sample from those 200 chunks of the genome. We sample combinations of 199 chunks, and we estimate the matrix S 200 times, each time omitting a different part of the genome, which gets us an estimate of the variance of all these elements in S and their covariance. Those we store in V. And then S and V are the matrices that actually go into uh, genomic SAM. Now that sounds really hard and complex and computationally it is. Luckily others have solved the wonders of how to compute this for us. And so we can very easily implement it. Let me just show you in a browser. how this is done in Genomic Sam. It's in the wiki page of the Genomic Sam GitHub chapter three, models without individual SNP effects. And it basically starts by preparing the GWAS summary data we get, which is a couple of lines of code, right? Which gets us like the summary statistics in a standardized format. So all these core will know how to read them. And then after that is done, all we need to tell LD score regression within genomic SAM is where to find, in this case, the summary statistics for psychiatric diseases, what the sample prevalences of these diseases are in the respective GWASs, what the population prevalence of the traits are in the population, where it can find these LD scores I've been discussing, what I want my traits to be named, and then I just run the function LDSC. And Everything we just discussed, the estimating of S, the estimating of V, is done automatically and it's stored in an object which you can then use to start running genomic SAM models. It also means you don't need to rerun all those steps. You can store the object you created. So you don't need to rerun LD score all the time. Okay, thank you for joining us for this lecture and catch you in the next one.